This is Taking It to the Nub with Shirtless Mike and Boston Jimmy. This is episode number 12, and today uh, it's Memorial Day Every weekend. Day. We are uh, opening up the country, and we are opening up this Taking It to the Nub tonight to Mike Bellity from MLB Cigar Ventures. So let's go bring Mike in. Mike. What's happening? Welcome to episode 12 of season one of Taking It to the Nub. Awesome. Yes, you welcome, did Mike. A great job, by the way. I've watched several of your episodes, and they're very good. Well, we're trying. We're trying to make it better each time. Um, for today, uh, a couple of things. Before we start, we do a little something different in the very beginning because this is Memorial Day. So yeah. we take, I want to take a moment here um, of silence to just think of all of those that have given the ultimate sacrifice. So everybody just take a moment of silence. Thank you for those that might have lost family members that you've known that were lost in wars. Um, this is the weekend that we, we think about them all the time. So, Mike. What's happened? It's been five years plus. New Orleans. Yeah. That was a big day. That was, uh, that was huge. So for those that don't know, Mike, um, Mike has been the was the first sponsor of Stogie Press. Has been with me ever since. Um, thank you very much for for, for that. Um, it, it it helps us a lot to keep things rolling along here and do what we have to do. You guys do a great job. So happy to be one of the sponsors for sure. What are we smoking tonight? I just lit an uh. Of Imperia Aventador Robusto. That's that's funny. I got the <laughs> there. You have it. I swear we didn't organize this ahead of time. We did not we did. plan this. Mike, actually, where'd you get these, Mike? Uh, smoke rings. They had the, these. These are from before you started MLB Cigar Adventures when it was just being distributed by Quesada. I believe so, that's what I was told. So yeah, so a little a little history there. So I had MLB Cigar Ventures first, then signed a distribution deal with Quesada. Okay, so I had and a that's switch when around. they took them in. Yeah. Okay. And then I then I left that distribution deal, <clears throat> and Enrique Casas and I started our own distribution company called Sable Distribution, which is Say Hospitality. And we'll get into that in a little bit. All right, that's good. But I think Mike. <sighs> Holmes, shirtless Mike. Well, I'll, go, I'll use shirtless Mike and Mike to distinguish between the two. Um, <laughs> two things before yeah. I let Mike run with this, shirtless Mike. Um, for those that may or may not know Mike Bellity, the two things we got to understand. One, how do you pronounce your last name? <laughs> it's Bellity. Bellity, right? It's not Bellotti. Yeah. It's Bellity. Okay. That's right. But Nobody. I never correct anybody. <laughs> okay. I don't. I, it doesn't really matter that much. But, yeah, it's, technically it's Bellity. My wife corrected me a long time ago. Uh, the, other quite, the, the other statement we should make is um, MLB Cigar Ventures does not stand for Major League Baseball. It doesn't. It's, it stands for my initials. Uh, MLB are my initials. My my full name is Mike Michael Lawrence Bellity. I thought it's Mike Rich as fuck Bellity. <laughs> <laughs> well, I mean that's a nickname, but my legal name is Michael Lawrence Bellity. <laughs> that's funny. All right. I, we could, we could talk about how that nickname happened too. I I fought that nickname for a while, and I said, "What the hell am I fighting this for?" It's the, I mean, there's worse nicknames out there. We'll get into that. <laughs> shirtless Mike, you got you 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 had to, you wanted to ask some questions that maybe you know I, I I might already know, but you didn't. So, so is uh, what is your 
favorite pizza place. I know that you're big into pizza, ah. you know, and, and, and you like to do little tours, you know, around the Northeast whenever you're out and about. Yeah, so, so I'm a pizza freak, as, as I describe it. So I love great pizza. And, and, you know, pizza is, there's not a lot, well, most pizza places don't serve great pizza. You know, most pizzas, just, I mean, eat, but even bad pizza is still pizza, right? So it's still okay. Yeah. Um, but, but my favorite all-time pizza that I've had so far, and it would be hard for me to think of a pizza being much better than this, uh, is actually in Brooklyn, New York, at a place called Defara. And, mm. uh, you know, before that, my, my, tied for the second spot for me is uh, Sally's, uh, a pizza in New Haven, Connecticut, and uh, the original Regina Pizzeria in Boston, which is in the north end of Mo. Those two are tied for second. They were tied for first until I went to Defara. And uh, I'll tell you, uh, it, that whole pizza thing just sort of took on a life of its own. And to be in full disclosure, I'm a big fan of Dave Portnoy, uh, who owns Barstool Sports, and he does the Will Bite reviews and all that. So I just said, you know what? I'm a pizza freak too. I'm going to give my opinion. I started just posting on my Facebook. And it took sort of a life of its own to the point where I've done a handful of events in the last couple of years where they've had me rate their favorite pizzas, like their key customers bring in their favorite pizza and I have to eat them and rate them. That's a lot of pressure, by the way. <laughs> um, and here's what I'll tell you. Everybody thinks there's a pizza place in, their, in or near their hometown that's great. Very few times is it actually great. I just, you know, they, it just happens to be the best pizza they have near them, right? Um, yeah. Until you've had truly great pizza, um, you really, it's hard to judge what great pizza is. Now, I know Jimmy's been adamant about this place, Umberto's, and I'm going to go there. I promise you I'm going there. Uh, that's on the list. When, when we're let out of our houses again, I'm going to Umberto's at some point. Uh, but, uh, you know, the, the, that's, that's one that I've heard from a few people, actually. Um, so I'm gonna, I'm looking for that. I've been told that Staten Island has some great spots, so I've got to try those too. Um, but uh, Defaro's I gave on my scale a 9.7, and the only reason I didn't give it a 10 is because I need room for a better pizza. Like this, if there is a better pizza out there, well, how do I? I can't give it. You can't give better than a 10, so I said 9.7. So that's kind of uh, like me Defaro. giving you a 99 on the on the David P. Arlack on the PLM because we all know it was a 100. I mean, we know it deserves a hundred. <laughs> so, so pizza, pizza is a lot like cigars to you. You know, it's you, you don't know a great you don't know a great cigar till you have one, and once you have one, you start setting your scale and you, you readjust mm. yourself, you know, to that new great cigar, and you start yeah, looking at everything, no comparing it to. Yeah, there's no doubt. I mean, I've had some very good pizza, and oftentimes I'll go to places and they'll say. This is the best. We have great pizza right here. And right away, I'm skeptical because everyone that says that, it, again, just means that's the best pizza near them. But it's usually solidly mediocre. Um, occasionally, I'm surprised. But, uh, it's, uh, but, but uh, I've, had to, I've had to do some uh, ratings at, at events where I had to be nice, we'll say, because I don't want to offend anybody. <laughs> be careful you offended the pizza world. <laughs> I, well, I'm not worried about offending the pizza world. I'm worried about offending people that buy my cigars <laughs> at the at the event, and they're, you know, they're, they're bringing pizza. Uh, so this has happened four or five times, and it's fun. But I do love great pizza. That's awesome. So um, you know, moving on from that, you know, I'm gonna get to you know whole the alcohol thing after this particular question. <laughs> but you know, for through all your travels, you know, you travel all around the country promoting your brand and all that. Uh, what are some of the best cigar shops that you've been to? Oh, man, that's a dangerous question, by the way. Because if I don't mention one, then I'm going to get in trouble. But I'm going to be honest with you. Well, that's uh, the reason why I worded it the way I worded it. So you have opportunity to name as many as you can. Yeah, thanks. And you can yeah. apologize for, to the rest I'm of the I'm going to have to apologize. Because even, even if I don't mean to leave somebody, I'm going to leave somebody out. But I'll give you some of my favorites. And by the way, there's some of, some, some of my favorites don't even carry my cigars. But I just think they're great lounges. So um, uh, just, uh, let, let me let me caveat that before you answer. Mm -hmm. From what I understand, this is being broadcasted live on a TV at the underground. Now go ahead. <laughs> really? Yeah. Well, they're on the list for sure. Um, you know, I do more events at the underground than pretty much 
I should I shouldn't say that. I do more events at the underground than than any cigar shop that's not local to me. I mean, because I'm I do a lot of stuff locally that I just drive 30 minutes or 40 minutes. But in terms of traveling, I do more with the underground than anybody. Um, and I've made them some exclusive cigars that we can talk about. And uh, they're they're they are the most unique um, place I've ever been. And I know Jimmy, you've been there. It's a unique place. Uh, and the great people. Uh, love those those people, all the guys and gals that hang out there. Uh, even Mark Scott, who's one of the owners, I kind of like him too. Okay, I hope <laughs> Mark's listening. I always break his balls, but you know, I think they're great. They're great people. They do a great job. And the thing I love about the Underground is they are 99.9% purely boutique. But there's one sales rep out there that you know he's on the back nine. He's been in the industry a long time. He represents Oliva, so they have Oliva in there. <laughs> but other than that, it's all boutique. But they're stri- they're really boutique, 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 um, which is great for a, a brand like mine. So they're definitely at the top of the list. Um, in Texas, to stay in Texas since we started there, I would say Stogies in Houston is is uh, an incredible place. Uh, I mean, incredible. Uh, it just their members lounge is it's unbelievable. And the people there are they are so nice. And Stogies is the place in Houston where anyone that's in the industry that happens to be in the area doing an event or visiting shops with their sales rep or whatever, at the end of the night, we all end up at Stogie's. And we just hang out and decompress before we go uh, to our hotels. Uh, It's a great place. They've got something like an 1,800 square foot walk-in humidor. They've got like a 5,000 square foot uh, member's lounge at 24-7, 365. Uh, Jorge who's one of the owners there is just couldn't be nicer. Always takes great care of us when we go in there. Um, great place. Um, smoke ins, all of the smoke ins in Florida. I, I love those guys. He's been a friend of mine for a long time. And um, I would tell anybody that's looking to start a traditional um, uh, type of uh, cigar lounge bar atmosphere. I would, if I was going to start one, I would pick it a dab of Nas brain on how to do that properly. Cause I don't think anyone does it better than him. I, of course, love Corona. Um, I love, uh, in my local area, there's a small shop in Rhode Island called Churchill's Lounge. It's kind of like the underground of New England, if that makes sense, in that it's very a tight-knit family sort of atmosphere. Everyone knows everybody. Um, It's a lot of camaraderie. Um, I can list a whole bunch more. Where else do I want to go? Let's see. Um, I would say uh, in Florida, actually, Smoke Rings is a great spot. I love those guys. Um, oh yeah. Uh, let's see. Uh, Boulevard cigars in uh, in um, uh, Rhode Island is great. The Gentleman Cigar Lounge in Rhode Island is great. In Connecticut, you can go to Penthouse Cigars in Hartford. I mean, I can keep going. There's some tremendous places that are just really great. Gentleman's Aroma in Weathersfield, Connecticut, just outside of Hartford. Um, Quartermasters in uh, Frederick, Maryland. I think it's Frederick. I know it's. it's I think it's Frederick. It's it's right on the DC. It's a suburb of DC. Uh, in the on the Maryland side, tremendous place. Um, there's just a lot of great places. How far west have you gone in shops? That's a, and I want to thank you for that because I left out the West Coast, and I, there's a few there I should mention. Uh, the farthest west I am would be in Spokane, Washington. Uh, and there's a great place there called, called Cigar Train, really great spot, owned by a tremendous guy named Brian. Uh, you go a little bit uh, further east in Washington, you've got in Fife, Washington, you've got Smokey Joe's Cigar Lounge, which is an incredible yeah. place. That's where I go um, when I go visit my dad. Uh, it's a great place. I mean, it's just a great place. And they're just great people. Uh, and you have uh, Thunderbird Cigar Lounge, which isn't far from Smokey Joe's, like 20 minutes away, 15, 20 minutes away. Um, I don't know technically if that's Tacoma, but it's in the Tacoma area. Uh, great spot. So yeah, I mean, I'm I'm out. As, actually, technically, the farthest west is in Honolulu, Hawaii. <laughs> so, in fact, on April fourth, I was supposed to be there doing an event, and then stuff happened. <laughs> I don't know. I don't know if you've been watching the news, but stuff happened. Yeah. And uh, a few things happened. So that got postponed to October right now. It looks like, yeah. which is probably a better time Definitely. to go to Hawaii, anyways. Oh yeah. So we all know. You know, we are kind of come to expect your man. You love bourbons, you love whiskey. You know, mm-hmm. you're just you're just known as for your reputation that you like to drink and everything. Huh. So, 
I do. Uh, what What are some of your favorite, you know, bourbons and whiskeys and so on and so forth? Please yeah. Enjoy. So, if I'm gonna if I'm gonna have a, a whiskey sort of neat or with an ice cube in it, I don't I don't really put whiskey on the rocks unless it's a mixed whiskey drink like a Manhattan, which is what I'm drinking now. Uh, even that, the traditional way to make it is to take the rocks out. I don't do that. Hey, that's a nice flask, Jimmy. Um, <laughs> one of a kind. It, it is. It is one of a kind. There's actually one other we raffled off. So it's two of a kind. Oh, yeah, but, that's right. But I, I did raffle one off at the event. So um, if I'm drinking an everyday sort of just neat or one cube type of whiskey, yeah, it's Angel's Envy. I, I have a bottle of Angel's Envy finished rye. Uh, I'm, it's within a couple steps of me right now in case I get thirsty. Uh, I like my all-time favorite whiskey is William LaRue Weller, which comes out of the Buffalo Trace Distillery. It's very hard to get. Um, that's, that's just my all-time favorite. And, you know, I don't have enough of it because you can't find it. But uh, mm. that's a great one. And just straight Buffalo Trace. If you want to have it just an everyday bourbon, Buffalo Trace is tremendous. Um, I made this Manhattan with Elijah Craig. So uh, I love Elijah Craig in a Manhattan, but not so much, not as much drinking it neat or with a cube in it. So it depends on what I'm doing. But I also like rums. Like I like uh, the Kappa rum. Um, mm. I have, I love uh, the the Havana Club Anejo, especially from Cuba. Cuban. Uh, which I have, I have a bottle. Yeah, the Cuban one. I have a bottle of that at my in my bar downstairs uh, that has not been opened yet. <clears throat> um, but there's a lot, I, li I like, uh, there's a lot of great Dominican rums. Um, it really depends on what mood I'm in and what kind of cigar I'm smoking. You know, I think that the, the pairing decision is an important one. You have more spirits in your cabinet than cigars in your house? Right now I do, yeah. <laughs> but that's not, be that, not normally. But yes, I do right now. <laughs> I have a, a, a pretty large supply of alcohol in the house. And um, uh, and the only reason I don't have as large a supply of cigars is because I filled a few orders during this COVID shutdown because our warehouse is sort of in a transition right now. I mean, they're pretty much at 25% capacity in the DR, and that's where our warehouse is. Um, so we haven't really been shipping much out of there. Uh, and now we're in the process of actually moving that warehouse to Virginia. Um, and so that's a, that's a relatively new development. But um that's going to happen uh, hopefully within the next week or two. I hope, hope, hope this coming week um, it, it gets moved. That's the plan. So you're, you're drinking an Elijah Craig Manhattan, you say? Man, Manhattan, yes. So what are you drinking, yeah. Mike? Uh, I am drinking Early Times Kentucky whiskey. Oh, so. yeah, now, you've had a few sips of that tonight already? Yeah, I've, uh, I mean, this is all I've drank out of the bottle so far, so it's not that much. Right. So it's pretty clear so then, Jimmy, I'm, that, I'm, that, that whiskey does not put hair on your chest. So well, that's not, not, that's not what I was going for anyway. I just wanted something that was chill. <laughs> I'm kidding. <laughs> I love you, Mike. I'm, I'm drinking some Lip at 12 Double Oak. Delicious. Okay, this is a very nice bottle, you know. It's uh, kind of a go-to bottle for me. Um, I just knocked off some, uh, uh, the heck was I drinking, that, that Balvini or something yeah, the, the other week. And I need Another great choice. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Very good. I love Balvini for scotches. One of my favorite scotches. So, yeah. And now more importantly, Jimmy, have you had dinner yet tonight? Yes, I did. I want to hear about that. What, what happened at uh, Dia Vida tonight? So tonight, uh, <laughs> Diane made her classic Swedish meatballs. Um, it's a true recipe along with the uh, cucumbers and onions side, okay, and the vinegar, you know, that she lets ferment in the refrigerator all day, and uh, some, some small potatoes and nice gravy to put on it, the brown gravy, and the lingavella, whatever called jelly that you're supposed to have with it. So everything from scratch, obviously, you know, pork and beef in the, uh, in, in the meatballs. So. I just finished dinner, and I'm hungry again. <laughs> <laughs> Me too. Yeah, yeah, she, she, she went all out again today, which is normal. I That's think. awesome. 
I put on quite a few pounds in the last three months. I can tell you that. Oh, there's no doubt about that. I mean, not you. I'm talking about me. I mean, I can. I, <laughs> it's it's not good. You know, I'm gonna have to grow this COVID beard a little longer to hide this second chin here. You're gonna have to. <laughs> you know, gotta do with the Boston Jimmy. Just. Just well, you know, I go. had this longer, and then yesterday I decided I would trim it, and I trimmed it down kind of tight, and now I can notice just how much COVID weight I put on. Yeah, no, right here, yeah, you can see it hanging down a little. All, all, all our bearded friends have told me, um, I've gone past the itch, so I don't get the itch anymore, which is the first step, and then yeah. they said, now do not trim cut or anything to it it looks like you know weird it's all kind of scraggly but just keep letting it go until it reaches its length that it wants to be and then you do a little trimming and a little conditioning because right now it's like freaking brillo <laughs> wait a second i need to i see it because i've been i've been trimming it little by little for everyone and then letting it grow and, oh, they say and then let it grow they said let it grow let it get scra it's going to get scraggly like this but just let it go and then once you get it to where you want it, then you start working it. That's yeah, nice Boston thing. Jimmy came by earlier uh, to to pick up the cigar from me since I had an extra one. And without that, without the Boston hat on, he looks a little scary with this hair. Kind of looks like a mad scientist. He's got the crazy beard growing out. He looks a little oh, scary. Yeah. <laughs> Look, I forget which. I've been on so many Zoom herfs and all this stuff. I But I think it must have been on the Frontline Cigar. Yeah. One one time you came on, you had no hat, and I'm like, "Wow, Jimmy, yeah. holy mackerel! You just you've <laughs> mailed it in. It's over. <laughs> I've never grown a beard in my life, just for whatever. I never wanted one. Never. I said, you know what? Eh, screw it. I'm. I hate shaving. So now's the time to let it grow. And so now I just wish I didn't trim it too short, as short as I did, because it was it was a lot longer than this. But um, so I need another attachment for my razor, so I can get it a little bit longer than this when I trim it. But um, I'm probably going to keep it for a while. I, I mean, at this point, I'm, I'm like you. I'm past the itch. Honestly, Mike. Uh, honestly, Mike. I think you know, with the way you're growing your beard, you'll be the next candidate for the most interesting man of the world. <laughs> yeah, and he, and he is a guy that does a alcohol-related commercial, so that that makes sense. See, so your next gig. So let me ask you. Let me ask you a question about cigars. Right. Mm -hmm. So 2018, obviously, I give you the best cigar of the year. And, and I appreciate that. Thank you. And it's like, did you stop making new blends because you can't top it? That's it. You're done. You finished. <laughs> no, 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 <laughs> no, 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 no. I'm working on some new blends uh, right now, actually. Um, in fact, I've got some test ones in my humidor right here. Um, I've done some uh, exclusives uh, for a few places um, and so in 2018 and there was last year was 19 um, I didn't even want to do that trade show that, that that's no excuse for not coming out with a new blend um, but I didn't even want to do that trade show because I knew it was going to be um, not a good trade show last year uh, and it wasn't. I mean, we actually, from a sales standpoint, did okay. I mean, I, I actually was surprised. But from a from a um, foot traffic standpoint, it was fairly empty in 2019. And um, this year would have obviously been a lot emptier, so I'm glad they canceled yeah. this year, um, finally. I mean, it was pretty, I think everyone expected them to cancel it. Um, but it was really... I didn't, I didn't do anything in, uh, for 19's trade show, which is usually around the time that I would release a new cigar, um, just because I was busy more than anything else. I didn't even get down to the factory for that many times. For the first time in many years, I didn't even go to Pro Cigar Festival. I just got really busy, frankly. Um, so I didn't have time to really focus on it. Same thing uh, going into this trade show, other than some exclusive that I, exclusives of that I've done. Uh, but I'm I'm gonna come out. I've got some stuff in the works right now. Um, so we're, we're and, and I actually mentioned this to you in 19 when you gave me the plaque that I was starting that process. Then uh, that's gonna happen. I, I mean I'm working on some blends with Aganor so that are gonna be actually uh, two of them are done. Uh, they're ready. I mean I you are get you are packaging. you are working with Aganor so now. Yes, I've, I've done. In fact, I've made some exclusives with them that were very big hits. 
uh, very popular. Uh, a lot of people, everyone loved him. Was the greedy uh, little bastard one of those? Yeah, that's one. And I, the one that preceded that was called The Greed. Uh, it was a cigar called Greed. Um, and what it was is Underground did a uh, sort of a knockoff or a takeoff on the Seven Deadly Sins. Mm-hmm. Um, and so they say, hey, we're going to make seven, you know, something, you know, one for each of the deadly sins, right? You know, you have gluttony and, you know, whatever. And I got greed because of my Wall Street background. So they, they asked me to make greed. So I did that with Agonors and I did it in a 6x52 Toro. Um, really great cigar. Very well received. I released it in the fall of last year. Fall of last September, I think is when we did the event. Um, and they said, you know, this was, everyone loves it. Why don't you make a Lancero of this blend for our big annual multi-vendor event, that, which is called the UG uh, Roast, or and some, they call it two things, NFG. UG Roast, NFG 20. Uh, it, right. And so I said, yeah, I'm in. So I made a, a Lancero of it, and the Lancero was just off the charts. I made an unbelievable cigar. Amazing. So I started working with uh, Agonors on a few different projects. Um, we've got two done. I've got to finish the, uh, the packaging for it. Uh, I've got to finalize the name of the cigar, which I haven't done, which is, that just takes me sitting down and thinking about it a little bit. Um, but the blend is done. The hardest part's done. Well, I would think the trademarking is another pain, yes. It is. Um, you know, Trademarking is important, uh, but more important than trademarking is actually making sure that you're not violating somebody else's trademark. Well, that's what I mean. That's the most, that's the right? So, so I mean, these will be under the Imperia or the David P. Ehrlich brand. The blend will have a name that I have to make sure is not violating a trademark. But, you know, the crazy thing about trademarks is I have trademarks on all my, my blends, but trademarks don't mean anything. All they, do, all they are really is an announcement that, hey, I've got this. Right. But if let's say somebody out there made a cigar called uh, the Imperia Aventador or Aventador in 1999. And it's been on the market in some local gas station someplace in Idaho. Well, they could technically come back and if they can prove that they had this a cigar called Aventador on the market before I got issued by trademark, they have now the trademark. <laughs> Which is. Yeah. So trademarks is kind of just like a easy thing to way. It's a way to say, hey, don't try to do this because I've got the trademark. But just because you have a trademark doesn't even mean you're protected. Right. 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 Yeah, Which and, is insane, by the way. And 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 you the, the biggest problem with that is and I and I know some cigar brand owners that ran into the situation where they came out with the blend and then they came out with the name and they started to they started the marketing process and they immediately got a cease and desist saying you can't do that it's too close to that and that becomes, right. is the issue so you got a lawyer that researches all these names how do you do that um you it's actually fairly easy to do it yourself i do have a lawyer but it's actually it, it's not hard to do the research on yourself you go to the test t-e-s-s which is the I don't know what test is, but it's at the Patent and Trademark Office website, pto.org. You can go to the test system, which you can put in a search term, and it'll tell you all the trademarks that are uh, for that term, that that term matches or comes close to matching. So there's a way that you can do it yourself, um, or you could have an attorney do it. Um, if you're going to file a trademark, you really don't need an attorney for that. Right. It takes 15 minutes. Go online yourself. The attorney is going to charge you whatever they charge you. You know, it, it, there's, it, they're, they're just going to do the same process. Where an attorney comes to into play is in they they are going to be able to do a more thorough search on whether or not there's a potential conflict, right? Um, like I had a lot of people don't know this. Some people in the industry do. I had a trademark. Um, I wouldn't call it. I had a short-lived trademark challenge on Imperia when I. About I remember, year, actually, it was actually in about a year and a half after I released the cigar, and it was uh, a ridiculous trademark challenge, which is why I haven't had to change the name, <laughs> or the color scheme, or the band. <laughs> but 
it was a, it was a ridiculous trademark challenge. And, uh, but everybody said to me, don't even fight it. Just change it. It's not worth it. I go, no, I'm not changing. I'm, I'm going to fight it. And I, I did. And it went away. Um, but it was, um, I saw, I, and I did a thorough search of that trademark. There was nothing, nothing. And then this thing came out of left field fusion. The whole thing about trademark laws is it's the, it's because if you come up with something that's going to create confusion in the marketplace so that, so that they don't know if their cigar is my cigar or my cigar is their cigar. That's the whole thing. It's to create, it's because I have a right to control what product people think is mine. Right. If, if somebody comes out and directly copies it and makes a crappy cigar and someone buys it and smokes it thinking it's mine, that hurts my brand. That's the whole idea. Right. But it, it's gone a little bit too far as not many uh, legal things have in America. <laughs> you know, you, you've got uh, tort laws. It's gotten a little bit out of control. There's some legitimate ones, but it's, it's gone, gone too far. No, definitely. So um, we had talked before the show. Um, you had some potential swag, maybe we can give away. Um, How much from lighter? Lighter, lighter's cool. How many lighters we got? How many do you want me to have? Three. I got these in black. Three is good. I've got them in black, and I've got them in blue. I've got them with the. This is the Imperial logo. I've got them with the Ehrlich logo as well. All right, so let's do a little, have a little fun here on how many people have met or know Mike Bellity or might actually have read an article I've, or two I've written about Mike. Let's see how, how much one, you know about Mike. And one Mike. of those was very thorough. Yes. Let's see how many people know. With simple question, the first one on Facebook right now that answers this question wins a lighter. Um, what college did Mike graduate from and what degree did he get? So we'll let that one float for a minute while we talk some more. Um, you, in two years ago, you created a distribution company mm -hmm. called Siebel Distribution. Correct. Do you still have that? Yes. Has that yep. grown to carry any other products other than what you started it with? No. Uh, so I, we started it really just as a, so Enrique Sejas and I started it. Enrique owns Matilde cigars. Great line of cigars, by the way. Uh, if you guys haven't smoked them, then you should definitely give them a try. Uh, but they, so him and I both had a distribution deal with Quesada. Um, we both decided it was time to not have that distribution deal any further. Uh, so we came together and we said, you know, we can probably do it on our own. Um, and if we paid our own distribution company, the same distribution fee we pay to Casada, we could, the distribution company will at least break even, which is all we cared about. Um, but it may even make a little bit of money and then that's fine too. And ultimately the plan was at the time, and, and we may still get to that point uh, where we would bring in other boutique cigar brands um, to bring them in, do the fulfillment, take all of the, they wouldn't necessarily have our sales reps, but we would take all the stuff they don't want to do off of their shoulders. Fulfillment. We can even do the invoicing for them if they wanted to. Uh, we can do everything. We do the credit card processing, all of that stuff. We're all set up for that. Um, we never did that mostly because we would have had to expand the warehouse, which is in a part of Hochi Blanco's facility in Santiago. Um, and that would have been a big undertaking. And now we've got an opportunity to move our fulfillment and uh, invoicing and everything to Virginia. Uh, so we're doing that. Um, ultimately, we may, we may still do that. I think there's, there's a place in this industry for helping small boutique companies to do all of that stuff that, they're, that they are, A, not good at, B, don't want to do, uh, and C, don't have the time to do anything if they wanted to do it. Um, to take that off of their shoulders is a really – um, a really, there's a real business there. Um, so I think we may get there at some point. Um, we're just not there yet. And you've got, a, you got a pretty big footprint now as far as shops that know you, mm -hmm. and you do business with. So bringing in, bringing in a line that isn't even yours, but under Siebel distribution, just opens some doors for people and you'd be very selective. I imagine on which ones those would be. 
Yeah, it would. And, and I think initially, if we were to take on a new line, it wouldn't be to actually represent them. It would just be to do the work for them, do the back office stuff. Um, see, I, I have all of my sales reps are independent um, uh, contractors, basically. They, they represent my stuff, Enrique stuff, and they might represent anywhere between two and four or so other brands, as well as an accessory line or two or whatever. So they don't work for us. So I can't go to them and say, I need you to take this line on. I can ask them if they want to, but I'm not their boss. Um, so I can't say, hey, by the way, guys, you know, we're taking on distribution for XYZ company. It's going to be in your portfolio now. They don't have to take that cigar on. So it'd be very difficult for me to say I, to somebody, I'm go- my sales reps are going to represent you. I can't do that because I don't know if they will. I can ask them to, uh, and I think a bunch of them would, uh, but I don't, I, I, I wouldn't want to even go there until I knew more about the brand's longevity and things like that. That would be important. I don't want to have a reputation of bringing a product to line in and it's gone. Right. And so that, that's all part of it as well. Okay. So we have a winner on the first question. Um, I'll go through some of the losers. Um, <laughs> Jim Rendar said Boston College. Uh, Ross Blacker said St. Michael's College Criminal Justice. Uh, sometimes they're Googling on the wrong melody. Um, yeah, how many wrong melodies could there be? There are a couple. Uh, are there really? The, the, winner, the winner is uh, Kevin Cor- Corbley's Bentley Economics. And he's a winner. Yeah. That's right. Here's the next question. All right. Now, some of these people went out to LinkedIn, they said, to try to find the answers. Now, again, (laughs) I'll I'll remind people, um, all this information can be found on Stogie Press. I can guarantee that. The next question is, um, what was Mike Bellity's first premium hand-rolled cigar? And I want you to include what it was and the Vitola it was. We'll let him chew on that for a bit. <laughs> um, well, you're really making them work. <laughs> yeah. So, being a finance guy in the past, right? You move into cigars, and you probably lost a shitload of money in the beginning of cigars. But maybe, <laughs> maybe now you, you're, you're representing hashtag RAF. <laughs> but in a world Not we're in today, um, when you look at the stock market today. Mm-hmm. Where would you be looking at putting smart money? What industries do you think are coming out of this the fastest? Well, I think, so I'm going to answer that a couple of ways. Because if you look at history and traditionally what does come out of this, out of bear markets the fastest, it's usually small and mid-sized companies bounce the most, right? By the way, that hasn't been the case this time. And it's not the case every time, but it's the case most of the time. And there's, that's because of a liquidity effect more than anything else. Uh, every dollar that goes into a small company affects that stock price a lot more than if, if that same dollar goes into a large company. And so what ends a bear market is money flows into the market. And so it has a bigger effect on the smaller companies. That's not exactly the only reasons, but that's the main reason. Um, this one's a little different. Uh, this one is the first bear market that was ever, ever deliberately created by the government. Now, I'm not going to get into whether they should have created it. No, no, we'll just keep with the story. But, but, but this is the first bear market that was ever deliberately created mm-hmm. by the government. Um, and because of the nature of this bear market and what it was that caused them to deliberately create the bear market, the pandemic, and so on and so forth, um, by the way, this is the first pandemic in any of our lifetimes that actually led to a bear market. Um, but uh, there are clear winners and losers that are coming out of this, right? So what are the clear losers going into this problem? Hospitality companies, restaurants, travel companies, hotels, airlines, you name They got clobbered. There's no, there, for a while, there was nobody going to any of those, right? Yeah, what I heard companies benefited? 
yesterday. Yeah, I mean, there's, and there you have it, right? I mean, it's, it's so those companies got absolutely lambasted. And I just don't see them coming back in a huge way, in a huge and sustained way, even when we, as we come out of this um, shutdown that we're in, right? Because there's still going to be a whole psychology thing with travelers. They're going to be, there's going to be less of that. So um, that's, that's something to think about. So what are we doing right now? You know, what have I been doing? I've mentioned you earlier, I've been doing a million Zoom herfs and Zoom events and doing interviews like this and talking. And I've been it's like several, I could be on one every night, literally. And I don't think that's going away. I don't think that's going away at all. I think it's going to stay here forever and not just for our industry, but for industries in general. So, um, you know, you think about a company like Zoom, well, what does it take for Zoom to operate? Well, Zoom has to be operational, so they, they're a publicly traded company. Um, but there's a lot of stuff behind the scenes that goes into making sure that Zoom can operate. Bandwidth, um, IT hardware, there's a bunch of, you know, everything from semiconductors to screens, whoever makes the buttons that go on the computer. I mean, there's a whole host of things that benefit uh, from the sort of stay-at-home revolution that's, that's going on right now. That's not going to go away. It's not. I mean, one of the things I've said for years, and I've used Zoom for years for business, is this is a great platform. And whether you use Zoom or, and I don't own Zoom stock, just in full disclosure, but um, whether you use Zoom or you use Cisco WebEx or you use some other service, Uber, yeah, I mean, there's a, bill, there's a million of them, right? That whole service, unless they just don't know how to do it, which most of these companies do, is they're really good. I mean, Zoom's great. Cisco WebEx is great. They're all great, right? There are companies that have been fighting the idea of letting some of their employees, a lot of their employees work from home or work remotely, but they've been forced to let them do that now. And a lot of these companies are, I guarantee you, sitting back saying, huh, this ain't so bad. We don't need three floors in the Prudential Center in the downtown Boston. We can get away with a floor and a half and have people remote work remotely. You know, so you're, you're going to see a revolution. There's going to be sort of, um, I think the work at home revolution, the, the tele, um, mar- teleworking is going to continue. Uh, not completely. There are some people that are going back to their office, but there are some people that aren't. Um, you think about uh, commercial real estate. Uh, commercial real estate, I worry about some of these commercial realtors, commercial real estate businesses. I mean, for the one for the reason I just said, where there's a company that doesn't need to have their people on site, and they say, you know, we're going to go, we're going to cut our four floors to two. Um, there's a flip side of that, which says there are some companies that have to have their people on site, and they're going to spread them out more. And so they're going to need to go from two floors to four. But I think there's more of the first than the second. Um, so I think you're going to, and there's a lot of restaurants that are going to be, they're going to have to go to their landlords and say, look, if you want us to stay, you've got to cut our rent. Have to. Right. We're at 20, right. we're going to be at 25 to 50% capacity. It doesn't work. So you're going to see some pressure on commercial real estate uh, rental prices, in my opinion. So I would be worried about REITs that are focused in that area. Shopping malls. I think you're going back to outdoor shopping. I don't, I don't think you're going to have any new indoor shopping malls built anytime soon. By the way, there's a massive one being built in New Jersey right now. I think, I don't even think it's opened yet. I think that whole concept, those people are going to lose their asses. <laughs> I'd be surprised if they don't. I mean, it's the biggest mall. It's the people from the mall of America, by the way. And you know, I, what I heard was they put the mall of America on as collateral to build this one. Well, malls are great for, uh, guys my age and older to go in and, and walk around and get their exercise um, in an air-conditioned environment, you know, just, just walking around a mall. I mean, I, you see that all the time. But I agree. Yep. Malls in, in, in the new generation of, of uh, shoppers and millennials, they don't go to malls. These guys, these guys click a button and stuff's showing up at their house the next well, day. Well, that's the they other like thing. It, they get free shipping to send it back. So that's the other thing, right? Is like some, a lot of people that were fighting the whole Amazon thing. I don't order from Amazon. I go to my local uh, store. They were forced to order from Amazon or forced to order from, uh, and a lot of them had their groceries delivered and, and everything else. 
And now they, they may have realized some, some percentage of those people are sitting at home going, it ain't so bad. I actually, it's actually a great service, right? I'll, I'll tell you a quick story. So my oldest daughter was in Barcelona when this whole thing hit. She was in Barcelona the night that President Trump held his Oval Office address and banned travel from Europe to America. So we flew her home. She was flying home two days later anyways, but so that she wasn't forced to go through whatever the hell they were going to do on, after the deadline, to, even to American citizens, we, we flew her home early. Now, her and her two friends decided to self-quarantine. So they went to one of their friends' family's houses on the Jersey Shore, and they stayed there for about a month. They figured to self-quarantine. Why not do it at the Jersey Shore, right? So we couldn't get groceries for them. We had to get, we were we were shopping trying to get them what they needed to to go there and I I I texted this group text with all the parents and I said if we can't get them we'll just order from Amazon well one of the parents is like Amazon's the evil of the world nobody nothing Amazon gets delivered to my house and it was his house and so I'm like okay but I guarantee you there are people that were thinking like that before that had no choice but to order from Amazon certainly. And some of them are going to still order from Amazon. What? So I think you're going to see brick and mortar um, retail shops may never come. Some of the big boys are going to be gone forever. So when you think about the Zooms that you've been on, I guess, let's talk a little bit about that. And I've seen mm -hmm. you on a number of Zooms. I'm on them all the time. Um, uh, I'm beginning to see more shops getting on board with this and more uh, manufacturers and brand owners getting on board with this, which is, a, mm -hmm. I think, is a terrific platform to reach out to your consumers to talk about cigars, talk about what your brand is about, introducing new information, um, having that touch that you don't always get because they may not be at the shop that you're at uh, on, on visit. Right. Or they, they're not they're not able to go to the big shows because they're not, you know, in, in the industry side of it. Um, have you considered doing your own Zoom? I've done a couple just impromptu, nothing, nothing organized. I said, hey, I'm going to they want to want to sit, come on Zoom and smoke. Here's a link. And so I've done it a couple of times. Um, yes, I think I would love to do it. The problem is at some point I've got to see my kids. And I got to spend some time with my wife and, you know, I mean, like I can't do a zoom every night. I mean, I, it, I, I it, it, at some point you've got to stop doing zooms. Right. So I do two or three a week typically. Um, but you know, the other nights, no, uh, where I can see myself doing a lot of them is when I'm traveling. So let's say uh, I'm traveling through Texas and I'm doing events at a few places and, uh, but events, let's say I don't have an event on a Tuesday night. So why not go to a, a, a cigar shop where I'm not doing an event and say, hey, would you mind if I started a Zoom herf here and they'll be on camera and I'll promote their shop and, and we'll do a thing and then I'll say, listen, run a special, we'll do it from there. So I can see that happening. I could also see myself scheduling actually virtual events. If I'm in Texas, I could do one anywhere, right? So, you know, and they, they're run a little differently. They probably won't sell as much cigar. The buy-in for the retailers wouldn't be nearly as steep um, for the event. And I can see that helping some of the retailers that maybe um, aren't necessarily ready to take this big step of doing an event order to get a principal in the office that whatever company that is for myself or somebody else um, saying, Hey, here's a small buy-in. Let's do it. We'll do it virtually. Um, you know, because I don't have to fly anywhere. I don't have to get on a plane. I don't have to get in a hotel. I don't have to buy food at restaurants and, I can just do it from my house or wherever hotel I'm in already. Uh, and I can interact with your customers. Uh, and so I don't think these are going away. I think, I think you're going to see more and more of these. I think, I think this is a great example of what I was saying before with traditional companies outside of our industry who have now seen how telecommuting can work. Uh, we've seen it as an industry too. And, and I actually love them. I think they're great. I think that I, I, I think it'd be foolish not to do more of them. Um, and I see them, I see it growing, not shrinking. I don't, I don't think you're going to see them go away. Yeah, I agree. Now, when it, when you talk about brick and mortars in, in, in respect to, in, in the context of cigar shops, um, mm -hmm. you 
just note you noted earlier that you started to send out sending some orders out. What is your view right now on the stability of our brick and mortars? Oh, I think a lot are in trouble. Yeah, I think there's a lot are in trouble. I think, and it's not just in our industry, it's, it's across the economy, right? So um, I have seen data and statistics that range between 20 and 50% of small businesses will be gone. The most common range is 30 to 40%. That's about where everyone thinks it's going to be. I want you to think about that for a second. 30 to 40% of small businesses won't come out of this. If that happens, um, we have a real problem. That's going to be a long lasting real problem. And we've just handed our economy to huge companies. That's, that's what's happened because I want you to think about this for a second. Imagine it was your dream. Diane's a great cook, right? Great cook. One of the best I've ever had the experience of having make me a couple of meals. And I have, and that's not a, that's not an exaggeration. She is a tremendous cook. Imagine if Diane said, you know, Jimmy, I really love to cook. I'd like to, I imagine a year ago, she said, I'd like to start, I want to start a restaurant. I'm going to open a restaurant. I want to do it wherever. She doesn't do it yet. She's one of the lucky ones that didn't open it right before this whole thing hit. This whole thing hits and she watches 30 to 40% of restaurants, if not more gone, right? Think she'll start a restaurant now? She, no, is, now is the risk worth it? <laughs> but yeah, no, no, I don't think so either. Well, what I'm using as an example is like if I'm an entrepreneur, I have a new risk that didn't exist before, and that is if too many people get an illness, they can put me out of business. And I, and too many is not. What's the number? I don't know what the number is. See? It's a number. So. Now you're going to see less new small businesses created because of the risks that exist now. So not only are the ones that are existing 30 to 40 percent gone, you're not going to see them replaced with new ones anytime soon. So you take you take the cigar industry again. If you look at my my view is um, from the shops I've spoken to, they're 50 percent down in revenue. Um, they're trying to weather the storm, keep the lights on, and have some. Some manufacturers that have done tremendous things for these uh, shops that carry their lines to keep the lights on. Mm -hmm. um, but the tough ones, so Florida is a place where they'll probably weather the storm a little better because people smoke cigars all the time, right? Yep. You, get out in, you get up in the Northeast, you get up into the Midwest, um, cigar shops thrive in the summertime. Right? The weather's yes. warm, people are going to go back out, they, 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 they're they not going to be sitting in the lounge, you're going to go there, they're going to get the cigars, they want to go back to doing their barbecues, they thrive on that. Um, so to me, it, it's really about how are they going to survive starting now, today. This weekend is traditional summertime opening around the country, right? Memorial Day is traditional, That's at, beaches open, everything opens traditionally. Um, warm weather is in, uh, if they can't do business and people aren't going there, then they're going to be the first ones to, to take the hit. Yeah. And, and, and it, yeah, you think about some of the, you're absolutely correct. Florida has a better chance to survive than Florida retailers have a better chance to survive, uh, than new England retailers for sure. There's no doubt about that. Um, that being said, most, even in Florida, um, there's some behemoths in Florida, right? Some, and by behemoths, they're not like Walmart behemoths, right? There, there's actually no Walmart behemoths in the cigar industry. Even the biggest of the bigs aren't that big, right? But you think about the, the, you, the you've got a few big players in Florida. You get your Coronas, your Smoke-Ins, they're, they're, they're big players, right? But most of the shops throughout the state of Florida are not Smoke-In, they're not Corona. They're mom and pop family owned businesses that rely on that business to put food on the table. And they don't have six, 12 months. They don't have two months of reserves tucked away where they can pay their rent, pay their employees, 
pay their life light bill, keep inventory on the shelf. They don't have it. I mean, that's just the nature of most small businesses across any industry. And it's same, that the same is true about um, the cigar industry. And, I don't, and it, it's maybe less so in a state like Florida, but it's still the same. It's still the case. And so what's going to happen is you're going to see a filtering out, a, a crushing of those mom and pop, you know, this is our put the food on the table business versus and, and I don't mean to say that 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 smoke in like Abe doesn't use his business to put food on there. That's not what I'm saying. I'm just thinking that Abe has a a business that's robust enough to his credit. You know, anybody could have built smoke in. I shouldn't say it, it was not easy, but I'm saying like everybody had the same opportunity to build smoke in. Abe did a great job of building a business. So uh, and that's to his credit. So he deserves that he deserved that success. But um you know, he'll weather it because of his, how, how he's been able to grow his business. But what about the person who started uh, a business two years ago, three years ago? They have one location in, I don't know where, pick a, pick a town in Florida. And now they're out of business for two or three months. That's crushing. It's crushing to most businesses. Sure. Absolutely. Especially since and, most small businesses, when they start, if they can boss it in the beginning in the first place. Exactly right. And a lot of these people that start small businesses have put their life savings into start their small. This is their dream. This is what they saved up for. And so I, the, the collateral damage is that why would somebody in that same boat be eager to do that, say, this August or in September or next January? I wouldn't. I wouldn't yeah. go out and say I'm going to start a business that because now I know that through no fault of my own, I could be put out of business because of a pandemic or the government could determine that we've got to shut down for whatever reason and they can shut us down. Well, that's a problem. That's, that's a risk I'm not willing to take. So uh, we, I think um, there's going to be a lot of that. So we haven't got anybody that answered that other question yet. Um, what was the question again? I forgot it. <laughs> what was your first premium cigar that you smoked? Um, Ooh, that's it is on the that's gotta press, be a, it's on the Snoggy Press article. It's sitting there. You just got to find it. I ain't telling you where to go. It's there. You can find it. Um, anybody that responds to that um, now or after the show on this feed. Um, By the way, I've said what that is. I'm, I can't even tell you how many yeah. podcasts and it, interviews yeah, and it's, that I've been on. <laughs> search Stogie Press. Just search Stogie Press. That's all you got to do. Search Stogie Press. It's there. Just search, search Mike Bellity on Stogie Press. Look at the articles. It's right in there. Um, so we're, we're, we're beyond the hour already. So this has been a good show so far. So I'm going to let it roll awesome. just a little bit more. Um, I want to get happy. your opinion on, um, from, a, from a financial guy, all right, mm -hmm. and a cigar guy. I'd like to get your opinion on the of Imperial brands uh, selling off their premium cigar business. What's your thoughts on that? Uh, well, I think... I, I, there's a few ways to look at that, right? I but do you think they made they money got... on that? I mean, I'll just start with that. They spent a lot more for it than what they sold it for. No, they didn't make money on it. I mean, no. I, I think they, I think they broke even. They're lucky, right? Because I think they made money every year they were in business. Mm -hmm. But the problem is, this is so. This is this is a, a a similar discussion to what we just had about the 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 fear of risk. The risk. There's a risk when there's additional risks put on an industry. The, the price of that, any company in the industry goes down and the people that are willing to get into that industry are less willing to get into that industry, right? So you have Imperial brands selling and why do you think they sold? They, they didn't sell because they weren't making money. They were making money. They determined that the trend within the industry is that there's too much risk. The regulatory risk is too burdensome that they might as well just get out now. Because if they don't get out now, they're going to get squashed. Um, that's my opinion. Now, I haven't talked to anybody there. I don't know these people. But um, I'm guessing they just decided it's not, the risk is not worth the re – the reward is not worth the risk. But and they so sold I'm, off two we're parts, wild. right? They sold off the Altidus part, the U.S. Mm -hmm. part. And then they also separately sold off the, the, the 50 of their Cuban brand side. Yeah, well, I would imagine that's the side that has the value, right? The, the, that side has a massive value because that side has always got that sort of aura and throughout most of the world, that's the, the Cuban brands are the top selling brands, right? 
um, is not not totally, but in most of the world. If you go to Europe, that's what mostly sells. In Canada, that's what mostly sells. Uh, in the U.S., obviously, it's not the case because you can't sell them here. <laughs> but uh, yeah, I mean that those brands have uh, those trademarks and brands have a large. That, that's where most of the value would be, in my opinion. If I was going to buy the company, that's probably the only. Re- First off, I'm not buying the company. But if I was if, if I was negotiating on behalf of somebody to buy the company, uh, that would be I that would have to be a part of the deal. And now I don't know if, if you followed all the news on that, but um, last week they they announced a little discovery. Um, so it was bought by a company called Allied Brands or something. Okay, it was recently formed company. Um, in Hong Kong, and the principals in this are they're 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 they're, Ch- they're Chinese principals that have bought this. So basically, Altid is his own basically now by a Chinese group. Okay, so in the midst of everything we're talking about, the Chinese just bought out one of the largest cigar brands out there, and the Chinese mm-hmm. love cigars. I mean, it's, let's not you know we, we all know that. So. Yeah. I, I'd be curious to see where all that goes and what really happens with the Altidus brand and the whole portfolio. Well, what's going to go on with that? Do they leave it alone? You know? I think they will. I, so the, the China, <clears throat> I, I don't distribute in China, obviously, but uh, in China, my understanding of the market, and that's, this is true throughout Asia, by the way, uh, from my understanding, <clears throat> that there's sort of a barbell type of an industry there. You have you have the, the brands that everybody knows, right? The big brands that they want to, you know, they want the brand names. The like smokers want, want those. They want a GM and, Buick. Yeah, <laughs> correct. I should say there's three, three parts of the industry. There's that. Then there's the, 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 the brands that allow them to, the folks to gloat and say, hey, look what I'm smoking. The, the Davidoffs of the world, the Opus Xs, the the very high-end, premium, expensive cigars, along with the Cubans, right? The Cuban brands, those sell like hotcakes within the affluent parts of those countries. Uh, and then there's the middle, there's another part, which is just inexpensive machine-made cigars, right? Because still to this day, much of China and much of that region is, can't afford a premium handmade cigar, but they like to smoke cigars. Like they're not the boys. So they're, they're they're yeah. Right. So, so you've got the, that market and then you've got the sort of Buicks of the world, right? The, the, but they've got to be well-known brands, the Romeo and Julieta, the, you know, the punches, those, and then you have the high end ones, which are, those are the people that are taking selfies, right? And look what I'm smoking, right? That, that type of thing. Um, those are the three markets in Asia from my understanding. Um, well, you know, Imperial brands had all of those. I mean, they have them all, you know, right? They, they have, they have the Buicks. They've got the high-end, expensive. They've got the Cuban brands, and then they have, you know, uh, you know, the the lower end sort of. And by lower end, I don't mean bad cigars. I mean the less expensive, the sort of budget brands, if you will. Right. Right. So, if with with the PCA being canceled, all right. Thank God. We still don't know that what's going on with TPE. Um, and then the. And we'll get to that in a second. But the third part of the equation is into tobacco. Okay. The, the big Dortmund festival in Germany. Yeah. Now we haven't got all the responses on that yet. We've been monitoring that. All the media has been watching that. There's been a lot of conjecture about it, but they haven't fully officially announced that they're canceling that. If they didn't cancel that show, would you consider going to into the back this year? It's probably not. Uh, no, I wouldn't go. I would love to go, but I, I, I wouldn't go because I don't have any distribution in Europe at this point. So I guess there's, so I say that, but when I met you, I had no distribution outside of new England either. <laughs> when I went to new, to new Orleans for the trade show. Um, so there might be some benefits to going and I might consider going. I wouldn't not go because I feel unsafe. That's not why I wouldn't go. I mean, there's almost nowhere I wouldn't go because I feel unsafe at this point, but, but, uh, um, I wouldn't, it wouldn't be a, a safety issue for me. It would be more of, it doesn't make business sense. Um, so, have you so if it makes the business model of possibly breaking into the Europe model, because they've 
There's a number sure. of brands now that have moved in there, like Jocelyn Crowd has moved in. Um, and the small boutiques have, they're, they're, the palette is changing in Europe. All right. They're beginning it is. To shift. Yeah. And, and I will distribute in Europe, um, hopefully within the next year or so. Okay. Um, so uh, it's a little, it's a different game there. It's a different sales process there than it is here. So uh, I've got, I just haven't, I've chosen not to focus on doing that. I think if I focused on doing distribution in Europe, I could do it pretty quickly. Um, and I will probably do it within the next year. Now, what about TPE? Have you considered TPE for 2021? Yeah, I'll, I'll probably, I'm, I'm almost certainly going to be at TPE. If, assuming they have. Yeah. Um, by the way, I think uh, the unfortunate part of uh, PCA having to cancel this year because of what, what's going on um, is I don't know they can rebound from it. Yeah, I, don't I know guess we're going to have to wait and see how that all plays out. Um, you know, there, there's the other question of whether the, the whether Vegas continues to even allow cigar smoking in convention centers. Well, that's that's a, that's another one too, right? So, you know, yeah, whether or not we get to a point where it's economical to have massive conventions, because I, with social distancing, which isn't going away anytime soon, it, uh, I can't see it. I mean, I can't I can't see getting you know thousands of people in a room shaking hands, hugging, giving cigars out from my hand. I don't see it happen. I mean, I still see it. Now, I hope I'm wrong because I think that, um, I think we can safely do that. Um, but I just don't see it. I think that the, the psyche of most of America has, is now such that we will not get back, if ever, to a point where we could do that. And, and I think that's, a, that's unfortunate. I've heard pe different people in the industry kind of bring up the, the idea of possibly doing like a virtual trade show. Like every company will have like, you know, when their offices are somewhere set up and, you know, people can make appointments and see like the product and stuff like that. Um, I haven't really heard anything from the PCA about that, but do you think that, you know, that could be something feasible if, you know, in the near future or whatever, like in, in you know, instead of the trade show, what, what do you think about that? Look, I think we're getting to more and more of a digital world anyways. Um, I don't think that that, just my experience from doing the amount of uh, IPCPRs and now I haven't done, I haven't technically done a PCA. Was last year's technically a PCA? Or it, was, still it was after the announcement, which was early. Okay, so I've done one PCA, but <laughs> but, it, but the trade shows that I've done for the industry, um, there's such a social aspect to those trade shows, uh, and actually, I think the social aspect of those trade shows is far more important than the trade show booth itself. Yeah, so, yeah. gathering. Yeah, just yeah, parties, gatherings, hanging out, seeing people you don't see that often um, customers that maybe um, you, you only get to do one event at a year. Right. And you get this, now you, you, you get this, you know, buy that manager and owner a drink or take them to dinner or whatever and say, thank you for your business, whatever it might be. Um, if you do that virtually, it's very difficult to have that same effect. Um, the, yeah. There's base, there's basically, there's essentially three ways that you, you can build a, a brand in the cigar industry that I, that I now look, other people might have a fourth way. I don't know, but here's the, here's the way I look at the industry. You either have to have an unlimited budget so you can buy market share. That's one way you advertise the hell out of everything all over the place. You give incredible deals to get on the shelves. You essentially buy your shelf space. And I don't mean that literally, but you, 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 you use enough money, you throw enough money at it so that you can get access to, to, to market share. The second way is uh, you do the Rocky Patel, what I call the Rocky Patel method, who no, Rocky changed the industry in a few ways, but one of the key ways he changed the industry is in-store events by principles. That didn't happen in the 80s and early 90s until Rocky came along. And, and 
he went and nobody worked harder than him traveling the country introducing his brand my name's rocky patel i would appreciate if you tried my cigar so on and then doing the in-store face-to-face interacting with customers right i chose that method for how i build my my brand i traveled i went in i interact with people when i interact with people we generally get along and it's a memorable event and we have a great time and all of that all of that stuff the third way is you have to have sort of a um there's actually, I could think of a fourth way actually, but the third way, the third main way that I would bring out is I call it, and I don't mean this in a derogatory way or by any stretch. You have what, are, what I would refer to as sort of these cigar superheroes. Like they're, they're almost fictional characters, right? They come out and they got this look and they've got this aura and they're tatted up all over the place. And they're, you know, you know what I'm talking about. Jimmy's smirking a lot. He knows what I'm talking about. You know, oh, and, yeah. and, 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 and I don't mean that literally, like I'm talking about somebody like a Jonathan Drew who has a personality and a presence that's larger than life. I'm talking about somebody like Pete Johnson. And, and, the, and I admire the fact that they have that. Uh, Matt Booth comes to mind. Uh, Robert Caldwell comes to mind. These are people that they've got this thing. They're just from a marketing standpoint, they have this thing. And it's almost like and I'm not saying that they're being fake. I'm just saying that they, they have a character about them that is, that is, uh, allows them to more easily build a brand, if that makes sense. Yeah. I'm not that. Mm-hmm. I'm not going to throw unlimited amounts of money at advertising to buy market share. So I chose, I chose the other, the other, the, the other uh, remaining option, which is um, to interact with customers directly, do a lot of in-store events and things like that. Think about that for a second. Then. When's the next time we're going to have 100 people? You were at the NFG in, in 2019, Jimmy. This year, there was 400 and something people there. Yeah. On March 14th, by the way. And I was there. March 14th. Yeah. I was like, look at that date. Look what was happening. And by the way, um, I'm aware of a couple of people that ended up having the virus. Um, one had a pretty good run with it. Never had to be hospitalized, but he was in trouble. Uh, for, felt horribly for about three or four weeks. Um, but um, it didn't, remarkably, it didn't spread throughout that event because there's 450 people were all hanging out, partying, roast, the whole thing. But when's the next time we're doing an event like that? Be doing it again next year. Well, they're doing it. Now, he's got a new shop open, he's opening. <laughs> much bigger, too. And much yes, bigger. But, but the point is, like, what's... What, I can't see a scenario where maybe, maybe in certain states they'll allow this, but there's a, most of the country, they're not going to allow 450 people to congregate in a small space. Uh-huh. It's not going to happen. I mean, Drew State canceled all their bond smokers this year. All right. Mm-hmm. We're going to see the CI Fest. I haven't heard anything about what's going on at Rocky Mountain Cigar Festival yet, right, for next year, whether that's happening or not. Um, yeah, I mean, that's the way it goes. So you uh, are you ready for uh, – some short major league baseball season? I'm ready for some sort of sports. I mean, I, I've loved sports my whole life. I didn't realize just how much I still love sports until there's no sports. Right. <laughs> you know, right. it's, it's, uh, it's tough. I've watched enough Netflix and, um, I'm, you know, I'm about to start watching a new series, by the way, that somebody recommended me on Facebook today. And I can't remember the name of it, but I hear it's a, I hear it's a, it's a tearjerker. I don't know if I want to do that because there's too much other heavy stuff going the on. One, the world, right? Is this the one with the two women? Uh, uh, you're dead to me? No. That's one that no. we started watching. No, but my wife and my daughter, oldest daughter, watched that one. It's I've never intense. watched it. But this is new. This has only been one episode for this one. It's on Netflix. Um, and I don't exactly even know what it's about. From the interaction I had with the person that recommended it, I presume it's about... Um, racism and uh a young minority uh son of somebody and something horrible happens and so i don't even know if i i i uh i i'll I'll send you the name when i get it i i have it somewhere i haven't saved i'm gonna watch it actually probably tomorrow i was gonna watch it today but i didn't get to it i'll probably watch the first episode tomorrow but i'm hearing it's a heavy heavy mlb channel Right, has been showing the, the, the MLB Cigar Channel. We got our own channel. <laughs> you got to see that's it. So the MLB Channel on uh, on, on cable, they've um, they've been running uh, class the classic baseball series, the World Series game. Yeah. And uh, 
they 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 were running through the '86 uh, Mets and Red Sox series. <laughs> I watched that actually. I did really, watch that. That's really a painful one. moment. Painful. Yeah. I've watched on Nesson, which is a local New England sports network, mm-hmm. um, and it's the Red Sox network up here. Um, I they've been doing the same thing, but for Red Sox games. The other day, I watched the game where um, Don Zimmer came running out of the dugout and Pedro oh. Martinez kind of pushed him. I watched that game. What a game that was, by the way. I mean. Yeah, besides the yeah. antics of that, that whole brawl, that was a great game. <laughs> Unbelievable. It was I, an intense game. That's why you got the way you got. Well, and the thing is, I'm watching that game, and I know exactly what – I can almost tell you what the next pitch is going to be. I watched, I mean, I knew the game, and I still loved every second of it. It was, it was unbelievable. No, no, we um, need to get back to some sports for sure. Um, I don't know how we're going to make no it all doubt. happen, but um, they're all negotiations. They're, you, know, you might see NHL coming back to do the final to get the uh, Stanley Cup in. Um, who knows? Uh, empty stands, distance stands. You know, NFL will probably be the first official full season. They'll make it work. They'll figure it out. But think about it from this standpoint. If you if you have if you own a franchise, um, and you're you're Bob Kraft, okay, you own, you're used to having sixty five thousand. I don't know what the capacity of July is. Sixty five ish thousand, maybe sixty seven, sixty three. I don't know what it. People in at every game. So you sell out every game. That's your revenue model. You know you know on average you're going to sell this much beer these many hot dogs, you're going to get all this revenue from concessions. And from that, you can determine, I can afford to pay X to my players. Right. Well, now you cut that in at least half. Yeah, but is that what revenue happens? really, is the revenue from the game actually a major factor in the paying the salary? Or is it the revenue coming in from the advertising that's really paying? I think that the well, stands, I think the ballpark is being maintained a lot by the ballpark rep than it is more the salary of the players. I don't know about that. I mean, I think that, look, I, you have the NFL get, so you, the NFL gets all this advertising revenue, right? Mm-hmm. From Fox and the ESPN and, you know, you name it, right? And then that gets spread essentially somewhat throughout the league to all the franchises. I don't know to what extent it does. I, I don't. I haven't looked at the numbers, but they. Some of that goes to each, you know, team and all that stuff. Um, but I don't think the New England Patriots, for example, are getting enough money from advertising to pay a hundred and something million dollars a year in uh, salaries. I, it's more than a hundred. I don't know what the salary cap is, but it's big, right? Huge. I I don't see it. And, and in baseball, it's worse. Yeah, you know, you look you look at someone like the Red Sox, who last you know last couple of years had the highest payroll in baseball, paying yeah. two hundred and something million dollars a year. If they and they only have a thirty something thousand uh, capacity stadium, they can only put eighteen thousand people there. They're screwed. Well, again, that that would be more my equation because I think that the advertising revenue on every game is bringing in significant revenue to pay those salaries as opposed to, you know, you got to upkeep it. The ballpark requires a a pretty big chunk of change to maintain the ballpark. You know, you got, you know, you got, you got, you got to clean it. You got to take care of it. You got to take a collect, all that stuff. So who knows? Who knows? Well, I just hope we can watch. It's definitely interesting. And since I'm not a sports guy, I learned something new. So, um, so this brings us well beyond the hour, but as I always do at the end, um, I'd like to go through um, some of the latest things that were out on Stogie Press this past week, if people have missed it. And, and your internet didn't cut out, and I didn't have to carry that part of the show this week. <laughs> so I'm going to uh, – let me just share – let me just share this. Um, so, first and foremost, yesterday, 
for all the Gurkha fans in the audience. Um, I did a review of the new Gurkha Real. Um, and I'm going to tell you, this is a spectacular cigar. Okay, so they did a really good job. And for those that don't even know, um, last year, 2019, was a rather spectacular year for Gurkha because a lot of things happened. Um, it was their 30th anniversary since Kaizad acquired the brand. So he's been running that company for 30 years as the CEO. They hired Jim Colucci from Sindicato last year to be the COO and the president. So he's taken the reins of that day-to-day -day operations. And they released a boatload of cigars last year, which they generally release a lot of cigars. But some were pretty spectacular. Um, but this particular one, the Gurkha Real, and it's pronounced Royale, all right, which means royal, all right? Um, I, I found this to be a very pleasant cigar. It, um, you know, it's, a, it's an Ecuadorian Connecticut. It's got your typical Dominican Olar tobacco in it. Creole 98 in Nicaragua comes in four different Vitolas. But the, besides the flavor profile on this, which was very balanced, not extremely complex, a cigar that you can easily smoke in the morning, I was really impressed with the burn. Look at the burn on this cigar, Mike. I mean, that ash dropped only three times through the whole journey. So the only problem I had with it was it was slightly astringent in the beginning. Yeah. Everything else, the flavors were spot on. The draw was perfect. So this is a uh, one I, I, I'm definitely recommending if you're a Gurkha fan, or even if you're not a Gurkha fan, you might want to check this one out just for the fun of it. Um, yeah, when I look back at that review, does that, come out of, does that come out of PDR or where does that come from? Oh, this one here comes out of uh, 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 Casa Cuevas' factory. No kidding. Which is another reason why it's a really great cigar, because Lewis makes great cigars. All right. And Lewis has been making um, Gurkha cigars for a long time. He's one of the, he's one of the, the number one factories that make Gurkha. Um, so some of the really good Gurkhas that people have had are coming out of uh, Las Lavas. <clears throat> The, the yeah, that, that was interesting. When I saw that review, I looked at it immediately because I saw what you rated it, and I was like, I have to look at this. Because, you know, the, because, you know I'm not really a Gurkha fan. There's certain ones that I've had that I enjoyed, but overall I'm not. So, I mean, I'm, I'm not somebody that's going to, you know, hate. Like if a cigar that may not, you know, if it, if it does well, you know, I'm not going to hate on that. It was definitely interesting to read that review. I was working. And then all of a sudden, I saw that come in my email. I clicked on it. In between, I was sitting there going through it. I was like, wow, 95. I'll have to try that sometime. And it's sub $9. Nice. So it, the price is right in the wheelhouse of the average smoker. Um, our friends from Warfighter Cigars, uh, Mike, a lot. Great guys. Okay. They came out with uh, one of these very limited, quick productions like they do. But I thought this one was interesting because they call it the Warfighter Vaccine. And what's fun about this is um, they talk about some of the common usages for this. So you're tired of work, wife won't stop nagging you, yeah. Jody's on the loose, stuck in a quarantine state, living a lavish lifestyle with the stimulus check, enjoy a vaccine. And then they go on to explain that um, although the statement hasn't been evaluated by the FDA, it's not intended to diagnose, treat, cure, or prevent any disease. And there are some side effects of this. And the side effects they listed were susceptibility to mind control by nefarious forces, blue tinge vision, <laughs> some mutation, telekinesis. And then they explain that it's not for expectant mothers may cause pyromania in gestation children. <laughs> so they did a great job, you know, and, and I kind of broke it up a little bit better and bulletized it for them. And so I found this, uh, I'm looking to get my hands on these uh, just for the fun of it. Um, we uh, published the, uh, the post-production of Taking the Nub with Alec and Bradley. It was an excellent show last week. Um, we're looking to get um, his brother on Bradley in, in, in the ensuing weeks. Um, to give his take on the brand. Um, Island Life Cycle, 
Lifestyle, uh, who makes the um, Island Lifestyle cigars and connected with Tommy Bahama. Um, they did a they they did a repackaging, but basically they they moved the ten box ten count boxes, kind of re redesigned the boxes so a little more pop on it, and they actually um, have a program for retailers where if you if the retailer buys I think two box I, I forget how many but if they buy I think two boxes or something they get one of these really cool ashtrays which fits right inside your car. It's like valued at like 30 bucks or something. But so this gives them an opportunity to sell some additional swag and, you know, bring some stuff in. Um, Crown Heads announced that they're coming out with their Four Kicks Mule Kick 2020. So this is a cigar that's been around for a while. Um, they, they, they kicked this off back in 2012. They've been coming out with it on a regular basis. So if you're a, a Crown Heads fan, um, definitely go check out check it out. Um, it should be showing up in shops now. They have a production of about 5,000 cigars on that. Um, we did do some reviews. We did a Don Rafa cigars. Don Rafa is based out of Chicago. Um, I did one of their others on their Habano. This is what's called their Fatback Habano, which is a small four and a half by 60. Kind of reminds me of like a Drew Estate pig, okay? Um, so this cigar was, was pretty decent. Um, had a couple little little burny things going on with it. Um, the real, real issues I had here was it, it did burn a little hot to the touch from the midway down. So once that thing got ignited, it did start to burn a little hot. And I was only really getting a medium amount of smoke out of it. Um, so that's... Uh, the Don Roffer. I got a few more of them I have to review. And then the other big thing that came out uh, was Ace Prime. So remember, Ace Prime is the uh, distribution company uh, that was formed between um, a company called Ace Prime and Tobacco Laro Pachado. And what they did is they actually put out an article um, to the industry. And what they were talking about was what they're doing in the factories. Uh, in their factory, and the most important thing they did in the midst of this this this, this pandemic, um, even though Nicaragua is not being affected as much, what they did do is they are giving a weekly distribution of food items to workers on top of their hourly wages. Um, specifically, they're receiving rice, beans, eggs, chicken, and other basic items, and. Um, they also uh, chose to only open the factory part time in order to protect their employees. So they're doing some good stuff for their their employees. They, they, they're taking the right approach to this. They're taking care of the people that work for them and to produce their cigars. Um, I, I think we'll see more of that, more more stories like that coming out over time. And um, lastly, the uh, last thing was I also recently reviewed the Castagli cigars the basilica and this basilica has been around for a little for a while okay um it kind of got rebranded i believe in uh in 2018 when they changed over from uh bespoke bespoke cigars to castagli and we gave this one a, a 94 rating um nice cigar it's got a shaggy foot an open foot on it um they are pricey cigars um, the lowest price on this is the uh, Petit Robusto at $12. Um, interesting tobaccos in this one, I found. Right? So, you, you know, I, especially when I see things like Peruvian tobacco, I like that. I like Colombian tobacco. So that's actually good. This is being made um, by Hendrick Kellner Jr. At his, uh, at his factory, at the Kellner Boutique factory down in uh, the Dominican. So pretty decent. Decent burn. There was a little bit of a crack in the in, in, in the in the wrapper there, but it was only small, and it um, really didn't affect a whole lot. Although I did take the point off for it, um, so and it did produce an enormous amount of oiling above that wrapper line. So um, one of the things I like is when I burn that cigar, I see that oil start to grow on the burn line. I always enjoy that because it adds to that flavor. So those are the um, that's the news and, and reviews on Stogie Press this week. Um, so if, if you like this show, um, you can always check, 
check out Stogie Press for more of them. You can always go to Stogie Press and see the past shows. I've got links to all the YouTube uh, post productions we've done on each show. Um, Mike, it is a pleasure as always. We got to get you back down here to Via Vida for a dinner. Um, <laughs> next time you're in town, yes. You know, um, <laughs> the answer is we'll, yes. We'll do a little <laughs> temperature scan on your head and you know, we'll let you get <laughs> Listen, you can throw the food out the window to my car. I don't care. <laughs> no. For those that don't know, Diane, Jimmy's better half, is one of the great cooks in the world. I mean, she is unbelievable. Um, and for those of you to go back to what Jimmy said a second ago, that aren't checking out Stogie Press, or uh, not as much as you should, you should. Jimmy does a great job. Mike does a great job writing articles for them. Uh, you guys do an awesome job, and I appreciate you guys. Appreciate it. Mike. Thank you, Mike. I appreciate you, brother. And thank you so much for what you do to sponsor Stogie Press and helps keep me right in. And Jimmy's able to, you know, do a lot of stuff. And we, you know, we just, we, we do a big and, you know, try to give people that we support, you know, exposure. So. Appreciate it, guys. Thank you so much. So in, in closing, uh, one more time, uh, I will continue to monitor the Facebook feed for anybody that catches this after the show on Facebook um, or have been watching and are still trying to find an answer, go to Stogie Press, search on Mike Bellity, okay, or just go to MLB Cigar Ventures in the big list and you'll see the articles. There's an article out there that I talk all about Mike and the history of Mike. That's why we didn't get into it tonight. And a bonus prize for someone that tells, not only that can tell you, tell you where I bought my first cigar. There you go. What store? What store? So there's another one. And then the last thing we'll do, because we, we have one more lighter to give away, we didn't have time to ask that other question, is what we'll do, similar to the other shows now, I'll put everybody that has commented on this, and I'll close out the commenting on uh, Monday. So if you've been commenting on Facebook, um, I will take all the names of the people who've been commenting. I'll put it in my randomized spinner. I'll do a little quick video of that, put it out live on Facebook, and I'll pick the last winner of the lighter. And then if you guys get in touch with me with your address, I'll get it to Mike, and Mike will get that out to you. Awesome. And don't forget the bonus for the uh, store that I bought my first cigar in. The bonus That's actually store. should be easy. That's even easier than the cigar. <laughs> but we'll see what happens you, you got to go to stogie press to get the answers <laughs> it's a sit down there okay. it's not the hard to do <laughs> <laughs> all right everybody thank you very much again for the 12th episode of taking it to the nub uh, we'll see you next week next week um we actually have our friend from Viva La Vida on. Great guys. Okay. So uh, I just Great for got, guys. I just got some of their uh, Club 500s, which right out of the, right off the truck were, uh, yeah, pretty spectacular. And uh, we'll, I have some of those I'll be giving away on the show. Uh, and they've got a great story to tell. Those that don't know the story of Viva La Vida, and the team behind that, we'll talk all about that next week. The week following on June 6th, we will have Rafael Nadal on. And we will get into the Altidus discussion with Rafael and get his spin on that, what his take is. And maybe Rafael will play us a little rhythm on the piano. And then on the 13th, right now, we currently have scheduled the second rendition of Smoke Big which was the, um, is this documentary film that's being made on the LA cigar culture. Um, it's a 90 minute full feature film. Um, they are supposed to be releasing a trailer soon. They're working through all the details on that. And we'll have an update on all of that on the 13th. And that's where we are right now. We're gonna be filling up the rest of June and into July. There's no PCA show, so we got a lot of coverage we can do as we move forward. So thank you all.